Hello everybody and welcome back to On The Spot STEM. Today we're going to be doing Introduction to Electrostatics and Coulomb's Law from AP Physics. This is chapter 21 of Halliday Resnick Walker textbook 10th edition. The first concept that you want to know in this chapter are the types of charges. So there are positively charged particles such as protons and there are negatively charged particles such as electrons. And there are also electrically neutral particles, such as neutrons. Now, a key thing to note is that protons and neutrons stay at the atom's nucleus, which means that they can't really flow that easily. Whereas electrons, they're not in the nucleus. So whenever we talk about charges moving, it's always electrons moving. Objects with the same sign of charge repel each other. So for example, positive charges repel each other and negative charges repel each other. Meanwhile, objects with charge of different signs will attract each other, such as positive with negative charges. And a very important concept in this chapter is the idea of an elementary charge. That's given by E equals 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Charges can only be multiples of this fundamental charge. You can't have something that's a fraction of this charge. It can only be multiples of E. And this charge is also the same charge that an electron holds. There are many different types of materials, but the most important are conductors and insulators. Conductors are materials where charges can flow freely. For example, it could be metals, the human body, or tap water. In a conductor, since electrons can flow freely, the electrons, since they have the same charge, they want to get away from each other as far as possible. So that means that the net charge will be spread along the surface of the conductor. Meanwhile, in insulators, charge cannot move freely. For example, rubber, plastic, glass, or pure water. And sometimes charge won't be uniformly distributed and it might only be on one spot. But for this course, it's usually uniformly distributed. Another type of material that usually doesn't appear on the AP Physics exam are semiconductors which are intermediate between conductors and insulators, which means that they sometimes conduct charge and they sometimes don't, depending on the situation. The last type are superconductors, which are conductors that have zero resistance. And superconductors are going to be important in upcoming chapters. Now, there are two main types of ways to charge an object. The first type is conduction, which is when an object with charge touches an object without a charge. So in the leftmost diagram right here, you see a negatively charged rod touching a sphere and giving that negative charge to the sphere when it actually comes into contact with it. The other method of charging an object is through induction, and that means that there's no contact. So when a charged object is put near a conductor, in this case, it's a negatively charged object, the positive charges will tend towards the side with that negatively charged rod while the negative charges will move away. Now, if we connect a wire from the sphere into the ground, the electrons from the far side of the sphere will flow to the Earth through the wire. And we also assume that Earth is an infinite source of electrons, so that the electrons will just flow there and none of them will flow back. So when we disconnect that wire, that positive charge is still on that sphere. But that negative charge all has flowed into the ground, which means that this sphere will end up with a net positive charge. And this is the same exact situation as if the rod was positively charged, except that the sphere at the end would be left with a negative charge. Now, if we didn't disconnect the wire and we brought the rod away, the electrons will flow back into the wire to the sphere. And later, the positive and negative charges would distribute evenly. Now, the only formula that you need to know for this chapter is Coulomb's Law. And to know that, you need to know a couple of constants. The first constant that you want to know is K, which is given by 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newtons times meter squared over Coulomb squared. And the other constant that you need to know is epsilon 0, which is given by 1 over 4 pi K or 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared over newtons over meters squared. And epsilon zero will be used a lot in later chapters. So Coulomb's law is given by force equals K times the first charge Q1 
times the second charge, Q2, over the distance, R squared. This force is also a vector, and it points in the direction of the radius of the two charges. So if Q1 and Q2 were of the same sign, that means the force would point towards the radius, which means that it would be a repelling force. And if the charges were different signs, then the force would point inwards because the force is negative, the negative radius direction would just be towards each other, and those two charges would attract. And that fits with our notion of opposites attracting. Now you might notice that this force looks really similar to the gravitational force because the gravitational force is just g times m1 times m2 over the distance squared. So you would expect that there would be a lot of the same formulas and a lot of the same properties, and there are. There's also the Shell Theorem for charges. So Shell Theorem 1 says that if a charged particle is placed outside of a shell with charge uniformly distributed on that shell's surface, the charge is either attracted or repelled, depending on the sign, of course, as if the shell's charge were concentrated as a particle at the center. So in that diagram down there, you see that A would behave with that shell of charge as if that charge was at the center. And Shell Theorem 2 says that if a charged particle is inside a shell with a uniformly distributed charge on the surface, then it would have no net force acting on it due to the shell. So in that diagram again, B would feel no net force. The last concept that we want to know is the conservation of charge. So in an isolated system, which means that no net charge flows in or out, the net electric charge is always conserved. And you can see this example right here. If we consider the system, the rod, and the sphere, and we assume that no charges flow in or out of the system, we see that if the rod started off at negative 4E of charge, and it ended up at negative 2e, we can easily find, due to the conservation of charge, the charge on the sphere. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to On the Spot STEM for more AP Physics videos.